Welcome to New England Ski Journal's Base Camp Podcast, presented by Country Ski and Sport. Ski season is here, and it's time to gear up at Country Ski and Sport. Shop now for your best preseason deals at any of their three locations in Hanson, Quincy, and Westwood, Mass. Or shop online at CountrySki.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Base Camp Podcast. Uh, we're here going to the end of the season. Um, I'm Mike Speechin, uh, your host, with my co-host right at the moment. Producer David Yaz at your service again, filling in, pinch hitting for Eric Wilbur. And yes, this is the uh, penultimate episode of the ski season. So um, coming to the end, but coming to the end with a flourish. We are coming to the end with a flourish. Um, we've got one more episode after this, but this one, this is a first. We have not gone to the other side of the pond for any podcast until this moment. Mm-hmm. I know. And uh, may I say, magnifique. <laughs> exactly. That's about all the French I we're, can muster. Yeah, you know what? <laughs> we're, we're thinking about the Statue of Liberty right now. We're going to be in France. Um, it's going to be a fun one. Uh, but we have some fun stuff going on here in New England for the springtime. Uh, well, did you want to talk about the snow? Well, the snow. It is a ski podcast. You know what? <laughs> the snow has gotten extremely good up north. Mm -hmm. I mean, northern Vermont, Sugarloaf, um, going into huge events, uh, Sunday River, uh, Wildcat. They have all come full circle after a very, very difficult winter. Mm. And thank goodness. Because it, it, all these ski seasons, it seems like uh, at th there's a hopeless moment, and then there's plenty of hopeful moments. But, yeah, th you, you mentioned the spring. So so what can we look forward to talking to as when the spring season approaches? So spring is, is here now. I mean, there's some great events coming up. Mm -hmm. I mean, great events. Um, Bust and Burn is back at Sunday River. Mm -hmm. White Heat. Mm -hmm. uh, it is... It has always been a rite of passage when the moguls and bumps are soft, uh, white heat is steep, uh, a lot of actions, a lot of crashes, but <laughs> it is a fun, fun event. Do you enjoy mogul skiing? I love mogul skiing in the spring. Can you do it on your bionic knee? I'm not willing to try <laughs> skiing that hard yet. I okay. want to I I wanna be fully on for next year, but one of those things, any skier will tell you nothing you know powder is still number one mm -hmm. but when you're skiing soft bumps in the spring on steeper terrain and the snow is flying up in your face um it is one of the most incredible feelings period mm. so we have bust and burn coming at sunday river and it's followed up with another incredibly iconic bump event called the Killington Bear Mountain Challenge. Mm. Um, Killington, of course, not the birthplace of freestyle skiing, but honestly, Outer Limits is the benchmark for bump skiing in New England. Mm. Excellent. Um, so, so that's coming. We also, you know, have an incredible event in New Hampshire or back-to-back -back events all in the same weekend uh, we have the splash into spring, the blizzard splash pond at Cannon coming up. And we also have 80s Day at Loon. Do you know what 80, 80s Day means? No, but I, it sounds like it's up my alley. I am a child of the 80s. Okay. Um, well, if you like to put on your Nevica neon, okay, <laughs> that is what 80s Day is all about. Mm -hmm. Skiing old long skis and your cool neon clothing um there's nothing like it uh those were the days long before helmets uh <laughs> that were just you know it's springtime fun well it's uh new england's version of the hot tub time machine that, um, that, that movie took place on a ski ski resort and they went back to the 80s so let's um, do it again. well do it, it, it was one big party time back then <laughs> that you know a lot of things that we could do in the 80s we just can't get away with now <laughs> Uh, that's for sure. And then and then we take skiing and partying to another level. Do tell. 
okay, Reggae Fest. Have you heard about Reggae Fest at Sugarloaf? Yeah, man. I have heard of Reggae Fest, but but fill in our, our listeners. Uh, well, Reggae Fest takes it all to the pinnacle of springtime fun. Music, skiing, you know, enjoying a libation. Uh, Reggae Fest is where it all accumulates here in New England in spring. And that's a, April 11th through 14th this year. Um, there's nothing, nothing like Reggae Fest. Are you anywhere. a fan of reggae music? Oh, Bob you enjoy Mar- it? So I went and saw the Bob Marley movie. I did too. It was awesome. You know, Ziggy, Bob. Uh, it was pretty good. Jimmy, there were moments I had trouble hearing what he was saying, but just got to kind of uh, breathe it all in. Jimmy Cliff? <laughs> sure. Okay, come on. Uh, you know, I, I love reggae. Uh, but so th- as I stated, this is the first episode that we are going across the pond. We are going to northern France to Val d'Isere. Um, anybody that's been there knows that it is a beautiful spot. And we are going to be joined by Henry, Henry Schneewin, who is a New England boy who's made his lifelong endeavor over in Val d'Isere talking and teaching about avalanche safety. So coming up next, we will have Henry here to talk about everything Val d'Isere. Don't worry about a thing, man. I'll be right back. Like that? Yeah, I did. <laughs> Looking for expert ski, snowboard, and boot fitting advice? Stop into one of Country Ski and Sports' three locations in Quincy, Westwood, or Hanson, Mass. As a third-generation family business, Country Ski has provided Boston-area skiers with the best service and discounts in the area for over 50 years. Whether you are brand new to the sport or a seasoned veteran, Country Ski has the equipment and accessories for all ability levels. Don't forget to ask about their popular season lease program, which helps families eliminate the growing pains of purchasing new equipment every year as kids grow. And don't forget, any child 18 years or younger receives a free season pass to Saddleback Mountain with each lease from Country Ski. Visit CountrySki.com for all the latest information or to shop online. The Button Ski Hanger is a patented ski storage fixture that safely stores alpine skis regardless of length, width, or shape. This means that your fat powder skis can now be stored next to your narrower carving skis, your race skis, and your kid skis. For more information, visit their website, buttonskirack.com. The Button Ski Hanger is also available for purchase at amazon.com. So make your purchase today. The button ski hanger is simply better for your skis. At 4,237 feet, Sugarloaf is one of the largest ski areas in the east and second highest peak in the state of Maine, trailing only Mount Katahdin. Boasting over 1,300 acres of open terrain and a vertical drop of nearly 3,000 feet, Sugarloaf offers a wide variety of terrain for all ability levels. A historic winter is ahead with the debut of West Mountain. It's the largest terrain expansion in the Northeast since the late 1970s, adding 12 new beginner and intermediate trails, 88,000 feet of snowmaking pipe, and 246 HKD snowmaking guns. Sugarloaf is a destination not to be missed. Stay slopeside and plan your trip today at sugarloaf.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Base Camp Podcast. Now from Val d'Isere, France, this is the first time we've been over the pond. Uh, we have Henry Sneerwin. Uh, he is heads up Henry's Avalanche Talk over in Val d'Isere. Welcome aboard, Henry. Hey, it's, a, it's an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Oh. Welcome back to New England. Uh, we go back a long, long time. I haven't seen you in quite a while, but you grew up in the Boston area. Tell us about ski- what, how skiing became such an important part of your life. Well, I grew up in the, initially in the Newton Needham area. And when I was about four or five years old, my, my parents got the bug. Uh, so they were in their, you know, late twenties or so I was four or five. And, and, uh, so uh, for about 10, 12, 12 years, starting at when I was about five, six years old, um, they rented um, a little chalet a few miles away from Sugarbush. 
So, um, you know, I got into it that way. Every, every vacation, every weekend we drove up. And, uh, so it just became part of my, part of, part of my very being from a very, very young age. Sugar Bush. Oh, skiing Castle Rock and, uh, Paradise. Uh, the snow's off stuff, good yeah. up right up there right now. What What's that? Is it? The it, snow it, is really good up there right oh, now. Excellent. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a lot of March, what they used to call March madness. I don't know if they call it that anymore, but there was a big, uh, a big, big events and all kinds of, of great stuff going on around March. And I can remember some really, really good skiing up there. And like a lot of young kids, when you grow up in New England, after a while, you've done a lot of uh, all of that stuff, which is great. So um, I got into the racing program. So I got into all the racing. But back then it was called the three and threes and fours, ones and twos. I think now it's the U, U10, U12. And and uh, and then when they when they basically moved on to whatever other sports they got into in their 40s and 50s, like golf and tennis, I still had the bug. And, uh, but I, so I, at, at, but before, so when they moved on, I, I did a, I did a season at Green Mountain Valley School and then, sure. um, and then, and then sort of gave it up for a few years and started racing in the Boston area and the Newton area. And that's how I got to know Dan Egan. I know you were going to ask me about that. So, um, Yep. Well, uh, we had Doug Lewis on to start this winter podcast off this year and, yeah. you know, another GMVS boy. Yeah. He was there when I was there. I mean, he was, he was big time. I mean, I, I, um, you know, remember afterwards, um, <clears throat> when I started studying, um, avalanche forecasting, I spent a year out in Bozeman, Montana. And I remember watching on TV, him coming, he got a podium and, uh, I forget what it was, a Super G or downhill, something like that. And um, he, he, you know, that's big time World Cup podium. Yeah, Doug, Doug did some great things, but he's really doing even more now with what he is doing out there in the marketplace. What took you to France? Well, <laughs> the uh, the first real influence around Sugarbush, uh, you probably are aware of uh, Shea Henri's. Oh, we just lost him. Did you? Yeah, yeah, he passed this year. Oh, uh, Andre. Yep. All my, all my, my deepest consult condolences to the family. Yep. Yeah. Well, I was. They were. Um, Francois and Francoise were a little bit older than me, but um, I, I was racing, and you know, his kids, I was racing in the same sort of Sugarbush club as as they were. Uh, well, that's very sad. Um, but that is a very big part of um what got me to France, you know, the French influence. And, and there was a, you know, in the, in the, <laughs> you're, you're going to laugh at this, but in the bathroom there, there was a, there was a, a picture of a, of a terrace on a, and, and, um, and a restaurant on a mountain restaurant, a picture of a, um, of a mountain restaurant on a terrace in the, in the French Alps. And this yep. picture looked like a window. And so it likes like five, six, seven years old, I sort of thought I was looking out at the French Alps because I was a little kid, you know, I was like looking through <laughs> this picture. And um, that was probably the biggest influence um, of, 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 of French and uh, French skiing and French Alps. Of course, at that time, though, there was also Jean-Claude Keeley was on the um, World Pro Skiing Tour and he was battling it out with Spider Savage and there was Henri Duvillard and all those guys. And also, of course, um, I don't know if it's still the case, but in Burlington, you know, the the sugar, um, the uh, in Burlington, Vermont, not far from Sugarbush, was the 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 Rosignol factory. So there was all kinds of French stuff around, and and so I was really influenced by that uh, by that. And so even though I gave up skiing, ski racing, and the you know the Easterns and all that, uh, started racing in the in the Boston area for Newton. Um, and uh, Blue Hill, and uh, for for a couple of years, I always my dream was always to go to, to the French Alps. So I got a I got a chance to go that on, on a year off before I went to Boston University. That is absolutely amazing. Um, seeing something in a restaurant and <laughs> getting a dream from it, especially such an iconic restaurant at Sugarbush. I mean, yeah. still one of my favorites, and. Um, you know, nothing like a great dinner and a glass of wine there. Um, yeah, well, when I when I was there, if I was if I was a good boy, I'd get a, a hot chocolate. And then they had one of those first cafe uh, machines. Apparently, the, the 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 rumor had it, or 
was was that that there was the first one ever in North America, you know, with the with the with the milk heating mach the 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 milk heater that that heats up the milk and with that uh, little rod that goes into the the milk and, and hot chocolate and I'd have a quiche Lorraine if I was a, if I was a good kid. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Europe Europe brought so much to the US ski industry and Sugarbush is one of those spots. I heard I heard you you and Dan Egan were competitors back in high school. Yeah, well that's right. Once I um so I raced from, you know, doing the Easterns and that kind of thing, the Vermont uh uh the sort of circuit, I guess you'd, you'd call it, um, and until I was like 14, 15, and that, that was the year I, I went to um, Green Mountain Valley School. But then I decided that, that I, I wasn't, you know, going to go to World Cup and, um, and uh, wanted a little break from that. So then I, I, I went to Newton South, and, and, and I started racing on their ski team, and we raced at Blue Hills and and Prospect Hill and everything and part of that um, Prospect Hill apparently is not a ski area anymore, is it? It's no, that something. was right in Waltham. Yeah, yeah that's, that, that's yeah. long gone. Yeah, but um, but so, so so it just happened that that Milton was part of the you know the 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 towns the, the high schools that we we raced against, and I didn't so I didn't meet uh, Dan in Sugarbush. I met I met him um, through the high school racing, and we were battling it out for we were always first and second, and um, and so and that was the beginning of a great long friendship. I mean, now he comes to Val d'Isere every year now for about at least a month, usually five six weeks, at, at, um, starting um, uh, usually in mid March, but sometimes like this year he came out in the middle of January uh, for his birthday. And uh, that's because I I believe he he you know he said it a number of times he considers it to be the best place for him to to be skiing when he's not doing his heli skiing and all that exotic stuff. Yeah, um, he 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 speaks so highly of Val d'Isere, and we'll we'll get a little glimpse of Val d'Isere here in a couple minutes. Um, you know, I cannot think of a better time though to discuss avalanche safety and awareness than us heading into Tuckerman season here in New England. Why don't you tell us what Henry's Avalanche Talk is all about and what you do? Well, in, in a nutshell, it's to help people have fun and be safe off piste and ski touring. You know, that's what we call back country or slack country is um, here. Um, off piste means you're just going off the trails and the ski areas are so huge here. And, 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 and the rules and regulations are such that, you know, you can basically, if you see it, you can ski it. Now, the, the ski patrol is not going to bother you. Um, they'll come and rescue you if you get in trouble. Uh, but that puts up, you know, it's a great thing because you have, have a lot of freedom. But, um, but then that also with freedom comes a, a big responsibility and your responsibility comes down to your, um, your safety comes down to um, your, your responsibility for yourself and for, for your group. And so I, I really help people have fun and be safe on the off piste and, 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 and ski touring and uh, yeah, minimize the risk and, that, and therefore help, you know, you, you, the safer you are, the more fun you have. Well, Dan, I saw a testimonial from Dan. He stated that your avalanche talk is for everyday use. What, is, yeah. what does that mean? Well, I've always aimed it at the general public and aspiring professionals. So I'm tr not trying to like educate avalanche forecasters or, or guides or um, it's just to give give people key safety points uh, so that they, they can apply them and and and, and make off-piste ski touring as uh, as safe as everyday activities like driving a car for an hour or, or, or two sure and and use the mantra safety is freedom yeah well one of my goals uh, over the years was to make uh, safety and risk management a liberating thing rather than a constraining thing. And uh, because that, for me, that's the effect it's had on me is that the more I learned about safety, the more I felt I could uh, push the limits and uh, without leaving leaving the risk down to some random thing that I didn't know about. So, um, you know, 95% of all avalanche accidents are triggered by the victims or someone in their group. Um, so that means you can, you know, you, the, the accidents are avoidable and, and, and you have a lot more control over them than, than you, you might, than most people think. Sure. I mean, decision making, when, when to say no or go is really such an important part. I mean, we just, 
we just lost a 20 year old up on Mount Washington and Tuckerman's um, and two other people were seriously injured and another two people slid all seen by, you know, um, snow rangers up on Mount Washington. And so much of it is good decision-making skills of when, Hey, maybe, maybe we shouldn't do this. Um, where to go, how you go and prep for rescue. How do you use these guidelines? Is that something we can use in beyond just Valdez there or Tuckerman's in our life? Yeah. Well, I'll put on that framework. I use a framework. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I've, I've done a lot of work, uh, in, in, in recent years, uh, with, with, well, starting with, with aviation is a fighter pilot friend of mine who got me into using checklists and decision-making tools to help reduce risk and, and to make decisions about whether you take the risk in the first place or not. Um, that got me into working with surgeons and even in the financial sector. And, and the, the, the thing that's really tricky about avalanches is, is, that, is, is that it's what we call a risk context that is high consequence because you, know, you can die. As you just said, you know, aval accidents can be very, very severe. But but low validity at the same time. So there's low feedback, which means that like when you test the environment, um, you, you, most of the time you're not getting uh, feedback. You know, like we learn from trial and error. If you touch a um, you know a, a, a red hot um, stove, you're going to get burned, and and you learn right away. But you can do what what, what could be deemed as reckless behavior, dangerous behavior, in avalanche terrain, and most of the time nothing happens. So actually, dangerous behavior behavior can is 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 validated, and uh, so the connections with these other uh, professions and other areas is is other areas where you can you can do you can be careless you can be reckless and most of the time nothing happens and so you keep doing it. But the problem is is that when things go wrong, the consequences are so grave that uh, that the serious injury or death are, are the are, are um, come in, come into the picture. So um, now, how did I get into this frameworks and using checklists and uh, decision making tools? Uh, well, as my friend um, A. B. Burke was a F was an F sixteen fighter pilot, and um, and then went on to fly for for uh, for United Airlines, and uh, and and he was telling me that in the in the in the in the aviation sector, most accidents seventy five percent are down to human factors. Sure. Um, so, so like, yeah, that's what I'm getting is that actually in these environments where you have low feedback, but they're high consequence, um, a lot of times the, the accidents are, are, uh, are not because of lack of education or training. It's because it's, it's because lack of applying and to help us apply the, our education and, and, and training, um, these types of checklists are, are, are really important. And the aviation sector is really at the forefront of, of reducing human factors and through using these tools and the 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 surgical safety doctors have adopted um, aviation techniques for that too there's a thing called the surgical safety checklist that was developed um, in large part by a uh, a, a local surgeon uh, at the harvard um uh at, at, at harvard his name's that tool go on day and he wrote the checklist manifesto um so that's how i got onto the surgery side of things as well so you you transferred you're mentioning or bringing up the transfer into other other areas is um, is, is is pertinent in these human and these low low feedback high consequence risk contexts that involve mistakes and errors that come about because of human factors. And I'll give you an example of a human factor um, that that can lead to death and why um, is uh, commitment. You know, we're all brought up to 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 to, to know and believe that commitment is a uh, is is a is 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 an attribute of our personalities that is uh, will will get us respect, get us results, get um, and 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 help us to be successful. If we're committed to our team, if we're committed to goals at work, we get rewarded for that, right? So it's something that we automatically uh, will apply. But if if you if you're co committed to the summit of a mountain, and um, and weather is coming in that and and there's obvious sides of danger that could be deadly commitment to the objective can then be uh really really danger dangerous 
And uh, what we found is that, and so that's a human factor, these automatic kinds of impulsive uh, behaviors that, that we apply that are usually make a, are usually help us to be successful can um, can lead to really uh, grave consequences. I think, I mean, you're probably aware, Mike, of the of, of the book and the movie Into Thin Air, where we're oh, yeah. to getting up to the, um, these are the, you know, the really, really successful people uh, can um, and, and intelligent people can therefore do like really stupid things afterwards. You're, you you look at the situation, you're thinking these guys were really stupid, you know, and, you know, a, a comparison in like in, in surgery, the mistakes that are made uh, in, are, are like operating on the on on the um, on the right person, but the wrong limb or doing the right operation, but on the wrong person. <laughs> it's really simple things like that. So that's what um, I've developed uh, my checklist around and, and framework around is helping people to, if they didn't know about them, the basic safety points that can help us keep keep us safe in the back country, off piste as we call it here, or ski touring, um, if you apply them. And if it gets really complex, for example, you you know, you don't apply it. So, uh, so that's, that's an overview of, of how um, I help people to keep them safe. I give talks and things, and I, I, I center it all around uh, basic safety points um, that people um, can learn about, but also have it in a, I have a little pocket guide that people can help people to, um, to apply those points to help them keep, keep them safe. You, you mentioned surgery. Um, I had a brand new knee put in on November 16th at mm -hmm. Mass General, and I had three different marks on my leg that was being done. They weren't going to make a mistake. Yeah. And, you know, they were going through their checklist. But going back to avalanches, um, you know, we lost a dear person in Kasha Rigby this year. In I'm Kosovo. so sorry to hear that. I wasn't aware of this. I'm so focused sometimes on the, what's going oh. on in my neighborhood in Europe. Um, can you... Yeah, were you about to give the overview of the, what happened? Well, or? yeah, you know, I don't know the whole of it, but she was caught in an avalanche. She did hit a tree mm. in Kosovo at 54. She is, you know, really one of the premier telemark skiers in this country. I mean, mm. just a dear soul with a dear heart. Um, but we lost Kasha for avalanche, and I don't know if there was a checklist or not. Mm -hmm. that was performed but you know there's as you stated there's ramifications to what we do in the back country and it's not disney world it is you know people have to realize that you better you know i'm going to put it point blank have your shit together yeah when you go in there um so yeah i mean it's it's pretty wild how did you end in val uh, well, when I was doing a, my my um, a, 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 taking a year off after after high school, I uh, by some extreme stroke of luck, I got I got accepted to Boston University, and I was able to defer my my admission for a year. And um, and so I always wanted to go to Grenoble, you know, because there, you know, there's a connection with Jean Claude Keeley that came from Chez Henri's and all that, and those years in Sugarbush. Because, uh, you know, the 68 Olympics were, were in Grenoble, and that's where he won his three gold medals. And back then, you, you, you did the Super G didn't exist. So the, see, he's still the only person to have won um, uh, gold medals in every event in, in, in an Olympic uh, Alpine um, uh, uh, series of Alpine events. Anyway, I'm, I'm getting off the subject. Um, but so that, that, that's what I, what one of the things that made Grenoble in, in, in um, and France really attractive to me. So I went there, I learned French for, for a couple months. And then just randomly, I went to uh, Val d'Isère, which I'd never heard of before, but it all kind of came together. This is where Jean-Claude Keeley grew up. And um, and I didn't even know that. It was called the Espace Keeley, like the, the, the Keeley ski area. <laughs> and, um, you know, back then there was over a hundred lifts here. Um, and I was just blown away, Mike. I could not believe the size of this place. And I came over, I had, uh, I had two pairs of skis. I had some slalom skis that were like, you know, those days, uh, you know, two meters, 205s or something. But I had a pair of women's downhill skis of, of 220s too. 
and those were the free riding my free riding skis uh, uh and i was just flying away around i couldn't believe the size of this place the powder and um and and that's you know that 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 really got me hooked on the whole uh, whole French thing, and I said to myself, then I said, I've been, if I've been missing this all my life, because you know the, the powder day in New England is not, you know, is not that that often, and but here it was really ha very frequent, and um, I, I said to myself, I got to figure out a way of making making a life of this, <laughs> and and you've done pretty well at that uh, <laughs> through the, through the years. Um, I was on a helicopter at Mike Wiggly's. Um, with a renowned uh, forecaster, I forget his first name, Akins, out of Colorado. Uh, yeah, um, uh, Dale, Dale Atkins. Dale, Dale Atkins, you got it. Uh, yeah, and, he's big time, and he's really into this human factor stuff and coming up with with uh, checklists for professionals. And he's, yeah, he, he's really well known in the international avalanche uh, uh, forecasting and prevention um, scene. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I spent five days with him, and it was really, really eye-opening. And yeah. he's a pretty damn good skier, too, since he was in the original, uh, f you know, event up in Alaska, extreme event with Doug Coombs. Wow. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I learned so much from him, uh, yeah. you know, especially being in the high country, back country of British Columbia. Yeah. Um, so are you a registered guide as well? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm registered as I, as I passed the ski instructors exams in France, which are, um, uh, which allow you, you have training for uh, backcountry off piste um, and ski touring. So, and I was actually the first American to go through the full um, certification process. Um, it's like the PSIA, and then you what you would a lot a lot of Americans uh, had done um, equivalency, so they have their their top PSIA, then they come over, and then the French uh, ENSA they call it the Ecole Nationale de Ski et, et d'Alpinisme. Um, then you have some extra bits to do, like your 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 ski your backcountry exams and training and stuff like that. Um, so a lot, a lot of people have done that equivalency, but, uh, um, and, and then, and then topped it up with, to get their French certification. But I was the first American to go from the very, very beginning to the very end of it. And, um, so that's my, that's my certification uh, background. So that allows me to take people, guide them off piste and in the, and, and, and the ski touring and stuff. That's awesome. What do you, what do you see is the difference between being in Val d'Isere in the back country and the U.S. Well, the um, the size has a lot to do with it, and the fact that you can go off any side of the mountain here and eventually end up in a village, um, and uh, somewhere, <laughs> right? And in 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 North America, well, just to give you an idea, I did I did some rough estimates a few years ago uh, for 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 a, a, a podcast that I did um, with with a group a few years ago. And if you take Whistler, which is the biggest, I think, in North America, the biggest, one of the biggest, um, Val d'Isere um, is, is, is it, depending on your calculations, about five to eight times bigger than, than that. Um, and a lot of that's because you can go, there's no boundaries. You can go wherever you want. And, um, and so that's one of the big differences. And also, if you ski off the back of a lot of these places in North America, you're going to, you're going to end up in nowhere. Um, and, uh, whereas here you almost always end up somewhere. Right. You, at least there's civilization at the end of the trail. There's some, somewhere, well, you know, you go off the, you, if you go even off, you know, you go off the trails, uh, yeah, you're going to end up generally, generally somewhere. And also this idea that, um, that there's no boundaries. You can, you can pretty much go, yeah, well, you go, go wherever you want. Most ski areas, there's, there's a couple of ski areas in Europe that have boundaries, um, but here you can just go go wherever you want. Um, everybody back home here in your your hometown and so on. What what advice being Tuckerman season coming up here? What advice would you give them as a backcountry specialist, avalanche specialist going up into Tuckermans or the slides or wherever? Well, I think you know. Um, well, I might uh, bring up my 
my uh, I'll, I'll explain my my framework a little bit. You already did the decision making, risk reduction, and and crisis um, management. So it is, um, depends. Is it safe? That's the question we want to uh, we we're asking. Is it safe to go there? So that depends on you. Uh, remember, ninety five percent of all uh, victims of avalanches trigger the avalanche themselves. So um, what I say to people is, it depends on you. It depends on where you go. Um, and that's decision making. How you go, that's risk uh, reduction. If once you've decided to go into avalanche terrain, and then also being prepared, um, being prepared, and being prepared for a rescue, which is crisis management. And basically, in Tuckerman's uh, going into avalanche terrain um, involves going into uh, and anywhere where thirty degrees there's slopes of thirty degrees steepness um, or more above you, around you, below you. And uh, 30 degrees is pretty steep. Um, you know, usually if I just throw the, that question out to people, they'll say it's like a, you know, blue run, green run sort of steepness. But actually, it's about a black run steepness. And um, and and so, um, but certainly, if once you're going to T Tuckerman's, uh, you're getting into 30 degrees plus, you're right in to prime avalanche uh, terrain. And um, so the advice I give people is, uh, you, you know, you got to uh, make if, if, if you make the decision after just after a snowfall, um, if there's lots of recent avalanche activity and the, the guys up there, the rangers, they they, um, they do an avalanche forecast uh, from what I remember when I used to do that, um, you'd see an avalanche forecast and, um, you know, talk to those guys. And if, if, if they're saying, you know, there's a lot of recent avalanche activity, it's probably better to stay away from the steep slopes and try to go somewhere else where, there aren't those uh, really, really steep slopes. And, um, and, and then, you know, um, uh, afterwards, what I, my, my, my really short version of, of, of risk, risk management or the prevention is, is if you're going to go on to steep slopes, stay away from, uh, uh, terrain traps and terrain traps or anything that could make even a small avalanche, um, deadly or, you know, at least a lot worse than it, it, it would be. So a terrain trap is like a cliff, uh, a narrow valley bottom. A lot of people get um, over here, even a small avalanche takes you into a hole. And um, once you're buried, you have about, you know, you, after 15 minutes or so, there's a very high chance that you'll, you'll die. And um, most people, 70% of all people um, die from suffocation in avalanches. So a lot of times it's not a very big avalanche take someone into a terrain trap like a hole and they suffocate or you were talking about Sasha um a tree was that was that the the person who was killed their name was yep. Sasha Kasha 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 okay yep yep so, she uh, she she hit a tree yeah so a, a tree can is a terrain trap it's anything that can make even a small avalanche really deadly so if if even a small slow uh, avalanche that's triggered um, and it's triggered by the victim most of the time, as I said, 95% um, of the time. Um, if it takes you over a cliff, into a tree, or into rocks below, then, um, you know, that's... The, so those are the kinds of things to to avoid. Once you go into avalanche terrain, which you, you got to make that decision, and that's based on the avalanche forecast and recent avalanche activity. If there's a lot of recent avalanche activity, you want to, as you said, you know, if you have your shit together, you say, okay, no, we're not going to go in there. Even if most of the time nothing happens, um, we're not uh, going to go into avalanche terrain because we know the consequences. We're going to play it, play it safer in areas with lower slope angles. And, um, and, and so that that's in, in a nutshell, and I'll show it on my framework is, you know, just if, 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 if people avoided steep slopes above terrain traps and avalanche terrain, um, then on most years, you'd probably wipe out about half of all avalanche deaths. Sure. That makes all the sense in the world. And I, I, I also, uh, because I'm, I'm sure people, you know, uh, if I don't mention it, people are going to jump all over me. Having the right equipment, the transceiver that sends a signal, receives a signal, um, and it, it's and having the capacity to have a companion search and rescue. So you have a transceiver, it sends a signal, and also you, it, you can you, you can go into search where you're receiving a signal. So you can find your 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 mates, and your mates can find you. And um, it's called a companion rescue because it's self-contained. That way, you can get your mates out in 15 minutes or less, or maybe more important to you, they can get you out on uh, in 15 minutes or less. And that takes training too. So it's having the equipment, transceiver, shovel, and probe, um, and and training with it. So those sure. are the three things. 
that that makes all the sense in the world well let me ask you this we're the backdrop is europe right there the northern northern france how you know there's a lot of talk we had protect our winners on this year um how is climate changing change affecting skiing in france and avalanche safety there well, I'm just going to first start with the quality of the snow. It's raining on a regular basis up to much higher altitudes than um, than, than ever. Um, and um, th- th- that's making places like Val d'Isere, um, at, uh, which is about uh, just under uh, about 6,000 feet, um, 1850 meters, is, is, is the, 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 the ski areas below that are really, really suffering in terms of, 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 of getting any snow at all. And then also, I've never seen so much rain going up to like, you know, 3000 feet um, meters, um, uh, which is um, close to the tops of the of the mountains, which is like, you know, 9000 feet, some go up to like 3500 around where I live the um, the mountains. Uh, so that's, you know, that's about 10,000 feet, but it's it's it's, it's raining much, much higher up into the mountain. And then you know, after that, it, uh, that, that affects, you know, you don't have powder after that, for example. So that's the, um, the quality is suffering quite a bit. Um, but, and the, 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 the app for the avalanche side of things, generally avalanche is contrary to popular, um, you know, popular belief, uh, on, on top of 95% of the time, it's the victim that triggers the avalanches. So it's not just this thing that comes out of nowhere. Most sure. avalanche accidents happen in December, January, and February, and on the cold side of the mountain, on the northish side of the mountain. So once you get down to like springtime, when you get warming and then freezing, which is the best way to to, to explain it, actually, is you have um, when you have warming uh, and, and melting and, and warming, what I mean is, is temperatures around zero degrees or above. Uh, zero degrees centigrade or above, so 32 degrees. Um, temperatures getting up to to, to freezing, um, and then um, uh, up up to freezing or above, and then you know getting colder at night. Then you have a really really stable. Um, you, you get a stabilization of the snowpack, and it's much more predictable. When it gets up towards the freezing point, it gets unstable, and then when it freezes, it gets mega mega stable. So it's much more predictable um, outside of these winter months. And so the statistics you'll see the statistics show that um, that December, January, and February, cold sides of the mountain is when most accidents happen. More accidents happen in continental uh, climates where it's colder, um, uh, like in, in, the, in the Rocky Mountains and in Colorado up, you know, up into, the, into Canada and the Rocky Mountains, as opposed to uh, the Pacific Northwest where it's uh, like Whistler and places like that where you get uh, more temp- uh, temperatures are, uh, are generally more around freezing. So all that to say that um, on paper with climate, uh, with warm, higher temperatures because of uh, global warming, technically the answer would be that there'll there'll probably be less accidents uh, because of that uh, stabilization, stabilizing effect of that kind of gluing effect of of, of higher temperatures. However, um, the whether or not it's going to be more dangerous for any individual depends on those individuals knowing the key safety points in terms of avalanches and applying them. And I just gave you um, three really brief, uh, uh, brief ones that, you know, uh, if applied, in my opinion, could um, reduce the accidents by 50%. That was avoiding steep slopes of 30 degrees or more above terrain traps. Remember I mentioned it could be trees or holes or whatever. So steep slopes, avoiding terrain traps, um, and and having the safety equipment, there's a bunch of other key points too. Uh, there's nine of them that I lay out um, to to in order that people would need to to make backcountry off-piste skiing acceptably safe, like everyday activities, that kind of um, that that kind of risk. But those three points are uh, are, are the are the key points and um, of of just as a summary. But it all comes down to my people applying those uh, those safety points. I think more so than um, ch- changes in, in 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 temperature, and um, yeah, like you know, it's just it's so so sad. I mean, it's yeah, hearing about people like 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 Kasha, Kasha, and um, and and that was up on 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 uh, on, on Mount Washington, was it? And in, in the winter, no, what? no, that was that was in Kosovo. Oh, it was in Kosovo. Was in your, yeah, the correct. So, okay. so she's a uh, local. Yeah. She was a, a local. Yeah. 
So, but where can people, uh, where's the site that they can find all the information about what you're doing and the full nine points? It's um, Henry's Avalanche talk.com. If you put Henry and Avalanche into your favorite search engine, um, it'll come straight up. Um, and also I have a YouTube uh, channel that I'm developing um, and uh, that's Henry's Avalanche talk as well on, on, um, on, on YouTube. Well, we'll get the new new England listening audience following you. Um, because I, I, you know, yes, Val is one spot, but I think it's pertinent everywhere w- where we ski, whether it be out the gates at Jackson hole or mm-hmm. park city or wherever anybody wants to go skiing. It's, it's good risk management on an individual basis. Well, exactly. And that's why I try to just keep it as simple as possible. So it's, it's, it's easy to keep applying. And, you know, like I was saying, uh, I'll just summarize what I was saying before is, you know, when no, most of the time nothing happens in these um, low validity or low feedback environments, we get really complacent. And what we start to do in terms of human factors, I mentioned commitment, um, we'll follow other people's tracks. And, uh, and that, that can work. That will work most of the time, but not all of the time. I've seen so many avalanches that have been triggered on the 10th, hundredth person on the slope and uh that that kind of thing and and people so people will defer to ways of 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 operating that work most of the time rather than the points that work all the time like the ones i i I have in my framework i don't know if that made sense let me know It, it it did make sense and um you know it's something for all of us to heed henry it was great seeing you again it's been a long time yeah. Um, I've, got a, I've got a next winter, make a trip to Val d'Isere and come see you and ski some of that great snow over in the northern French Alps. Yeah, well, I'm going to hold you to that, Mike. It'd be great to see you over here. Awesome. Folks, that was Henry Sneewin, uh, which is Henry's Avalanche Talk. Hop on, look at it, enjoy it. Um, another New England boy making it big over on the other side of the pond. That's right. That's Henry's Avalanche Talk, where safety is freedom. Awesome. This is the year to visit the Jackson Hole Mountain Resort. With over 450 inches of annual snowfall, 4,000 vertical feet of continuous fall line skiing, a world-renowned ski school, and terrain for everyone, the Jackson Hole Mountain Resort is perfect for your next ski trip with friends or family. Off the slopes, Jackson Hole offers adventure and relaxation. Visit Yellowstone or Grand Teton National Parks. See elk, moose, and bison roaming in their natural habitats or relax in a hot spring or at a spa. No more excuses. This is the year to go visit Jackson Hole. Go to jacksonhole.com for more information. Hestra knows hands. For over 80 years, Hestra has been producing the highest quality, warmest gloves you can own. Crafted with durable, form-fitting leathers, they are made with the end user in mind. Don't let cold hands end a great day of skiing or snowboarding early. With hundreds of different options, you'll find a Hestra glove that fits your needs. Check out Hestra gloves at hestragloves.com. That's H-E-S-T-R-A-G-L-O-V-E-S.com or at your local ski shop or wherever Hester Gloves are sold. Hester Gloves, taking care of your hands since 1936. Well, welcome back, folks. Um, Henry is an interesting person, um, and what he is doing over there, you know, when we talk about avalanches, about risk management in the ski world, uh, we we go to resorts, and that's when you hear the cannons going off uh, early in the morning at Snowbird or at Mammoth. Um, Henry's teaching about what it takes for me as an individual to protect myself and still have, you know, freedom. Safety is freedom. Mm. Yeah, what I took away from it was um, it's a battle that, that never ends. I mean, they've been, I mean, and... Sadly, you know, it's just not realistic to think we'll ever get to the point where there are no ski accidents, no ski injuries, and even no ski fatalities. But to hear that the amount of focus spent on using the current technology to make things as safe as possible 
is great because you know the, the you hate to hear the tragic stories but you always hope to learn from them right well yeah you do and guess what some of this isn't just uh off piste i mean palisades in california this year had a massive avalanche with people caught in it um being aware and having at least a little knowledge can save your life can save other people's lives um you know i use this term all the time this isn't disney world right. okay um even skiing at a ski area like snowbird like the palisades like um you know breckenridge avalanches can happen anywhere and awareness on all of our parts is so crucial to understand that uh we live in a very or we play in a very dynamic environment yeah mother nature's in charge and the disney world uh comparison or non-comparison is apt because when you get to a, a ski resort, you see, I mean, what do you see? The fancy lodge, you see the fancy ski lift, and you, you can almost be lulled into the sense that this is all a big ride, right? And, of course, there are going to be guardrails up to save me, but you, you must remember, this is a mountain that Mother Nature created, not Walt Disney. Um, yes, and I look at this whole talk about risk management, you know, Everybody has heard the story about how many skiers got rescued off of Killington this year. They were all in the back country or side country, even with kids. It wasn't avalanches that we're talking about, but it was one and the same thing. It could have been really bad. And it's because they weren't looking at their actions and what could happen from those actions. Um, but you know the good thing is everybody was safe in the long run just be smart and i would suggest everybody because i've i've had the chance to pull up henry's website and watch some of his videos they are really good videos not just for skiing but it could be going out in your sailboat or going out in your motorboat or going out in a kayak um you know the basis basic uh premise of all of this transcends just us and skiing absolutely and uh thanks so much henry for for joining us any final thoughts as we close this one out mike well my suggestion to everybody um get out there and ski and if you have a frequent flyer ticket out there you know i would book that trip to you know snowbird mammoth uh there's a lot of snow out west and if you can't do that Head up north because Jay, Sugarbush, Doe, Sugarloaf, they all have a lot of snow right now and a lot of great skiing. So get out there and get it. What time are we going, Mike? Oh, uh, um, you know what? I'll, I'll call right. my wife. How does that sound? <laughs> it's worth a try. Uh, we thank you for listening. We've got one more episode next week uh, on the Base Camp Podcast, a production of New England Ski Journal. And great, great episode it will be featuring uh, David Goodman talking about skiing at, at Tuckerman's, and um, we look forward to that. Thanks for joining us. He's Mike Specian. I'm producer David Yaz. The Basecamp podcast is a Siemens Media production. We will see you next time. New England Ski Journal's Basecamp is a Siemens Media podcast. Siemens Media, inspiring, informative, insightful.